working in the last week with uh, a document on the subject of purpose, of life purpose, as a researched construct that provides a number of identified benefits. Um, but I've been doing that because I have kind of a diverse set of focus and I'm trying to step into a position to see it all in one frame. And that's been coming together a bit. But um, this conversation and conversations like this and collaborative working vision is something I'm really curious about. Um, kind of in the last major surge of modern development, it was led by the kind of soul visionary who has an idea and then drives that forward and builds momentum and people and energy around it. And I'm, I'm a little bit curious if in this next wave of our journey, if it isn't, there isn't some possible quality of a sensing out of a collective space. There's a construct called insight dialogue where a group of people might sit in a circle and, and, and speak as if from the center of the circle. And that then each person's contribution of voice would be seen as a thread in the one voice and that way the, speak, the, the circle would speak to the group. And so I'm, I'm looking for and curious to see if there might be something about that quality of a collective seeing that might be emerging as a, as a valuable expression of human being kind of in the world today. So that, that's a little bit about where I'm sitting right now and um, maybe we just go around in the order of arrival. Marion, would you care to jump in and tell us a little bit about yourself and sure. about your attention? Yeah. Hi, <laughs> um, my name is Miriam, Miriam van Groen. Don't try to pronounce that, it's fine. Uh, and I'm currently in Amsterdam and I know Kabir, as he already expressed to some of us, from the Integral Europe, uh, European Conference um, in 2014. And I've been involved with that uh, and with Integral for a pretty long time now. Um, I used to be a coach and teacher and trainer, and now I am a psychedelic trip guide. Uh, here in the Netherlands, we are fortunate to um, have legal access to magic truffles, so psilocybin-containing truffles. And um, so I get to explore that world with people um, for, the, for their benefit, for the benefit of their self-exploration and their personal development, um, which is pretty magical and for, unfortunately, obviously, pretty much on hold right now. Um, but I'm... Uh, yeah, working on other things, including the embodiment circles. So that's an online platform where people can just join an hour long format of a circle in which there's meditation, embodiment and sharing. Um, and I am working on uh, something called the Guild of Guides, which is for now the Dutch, but potentially international inter uh, association, professional association for people working with psychedelics. Um, so that's exciting. And I finally have time for that. So yay, that's me. Leanna? Uh, so my name is Leanna Strelkoff. Um, I've known Kabir since 2003, I think. Um, we were injured very near to each other in time. Uh, and we met at Project Walk in San Diego where we were both training. 
and discovered that we had far more in common than our spinal cord injuries, um, which is not something that at least I could say with pretty much anybody else I knew that was injured. <laughs> um, so I, I recognized in Kabir a brother and have been adoring of him ever since. Um, since being injured, I have been a, a theater artist. I, I wrote a one woman show about uh, my accident that was very, very successful way more successful than anything I'd ever done before and certainly ever, than I ever imagined. So I did five national tours of that in the years after I was injured and um, that birth to speaking career, which I also hadn't envisioned, um, mostly in colleges and universities. And, um, and then I had my son and I tried touring with him once, three cities for a month and he was seven months old and decided I was never doing that again. So um, in the last decade or so, since my son has been alive, uh, I have been a personal development coach and really with a focus on the mechanics of transformation and sort of that, that period of time that actually we as a species are in right now where you're in the cocoon and everything that you've, you've used to define I me is sort of drifting away and uh, life as you know it is drifting away and what will emerge hasn't happened yet and so we're in that space where we are nothing and it's glorious except that it's radically radically horribly uncomfortable and so this is my favorite state. So I'm, you know, I'm acutely aware that there's a lot of suffering in the world right now. And that's juxtaposed by my sort of excitement, like something amazing is happening. And, and we have extraordinary opportunity and extraordinary potential right now. While we're suffering. So um, as far as my work going into the future, you know, my income for this year was dependent on uh, live appearances in front of large audiences and in-person group retreats. So shot to shit completely, that plan. Um, but that's okay, because I feel like that's, for me personally, that's correctly timed. I was already feeling like something needs to move here, something needs to shift, and I wasn't able to really let that happen. So I'm, I'm actually quite pleased that something external has said, you know, no, really, truly, this has to go now. Um, and it's a matter for me of as quickly and completely as I can, letting all these aspects of identity and who I am in the world and who I think of myself as and who I am in my home, letting that just drift off, letting that just go, 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 go. <sighs> And waiting and seeing what comes forward from that. So that's where I'm at. So happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Oh, my friend. This is amazing. There are already so many similarities between like synchronicities and similarities. I I worked as a performing artist in New York for most of my 20s, and now I work as a psychedelic guide. So there's like, it's like, oh, whoa, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, that work, that psychedelic work is, is put on hold for me as well. Um, and so I've been putting most of my energy into creating a digital incubator for embodiment practices in a time between worlds. That's what I'm calling it. I'm calling it a design movement collective. And I basically have a movement facilitator or embodiment coach of some sort come lead a, uh, an hour to 90 minute workshop operating on the gift economy um, and just trying to throw as many people in front of people as possible. Um, and it's been interesting because one of the questions I've been having is like, uh, how does the digital and the embodied interface in a way that feels like, um, 
not totally lacking. You know, sometimes like, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you know, we, we've all been on so many video calls these days. And um, sometimes I have the sense that like, I feel so full, but afterward there's also a part of me that's empty because I didn't get to touch anyone or like smell them. Or th there's just like so much information that's kind of like left on the table. Um, and it's like, oh man, I'm getting to know these people so well. And like, there are things that I will never know about them unless I'm in a physical space with them. So that's been a, that's kind of been a question as I'm exploring these being embodied, but also having to do it from our quarantined homes. Um, but it's been great. It's been great so far. Um, and I've been running a podcast for the past year and a half or so called Zion 2.0. And just asking, basically, it's a broadly about the future, but um, I've been talking to people who are sort of in the, the integral space and tangential spaces. We're mostly heterodox thinkers who are, who are working outside of institutional contexts. Um, like Daniel Schmachtenberger and Jordan Hall have been guests and Charles Eisenstein and just like all the people that I have looked up to for a while. And then once I started a podcast, had the courage to reach out to them and have them come talk to me for two hours and have been surprised just to how receptive people are to giving you their time. It's been a lovely surprise. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Kabir. Thanks for coming. That's wonderful. And thank you, Lola. Um, yeah, so I'm an artist. Um, I have a background in a couple different things, um, some meditation and yoga trainings and teachings, um, facilitation. Um, but mainly over the last year, I've been developing mm, two particular aspects of my work, one being um, how to develop a community art district in support of a sustainable eco district and the, par the parallels between those ideals, um, which is really interesting. And there's been some like art and culture consulting for sustainable development that comes from that. Um, and the second is that um, I'm actually in the final semester of a master's program and um, my project is all about trans borders, cultural connections. So how do we, how do you consciously transcend, transgress, um, observe, discuss um, borders, both internal and external. Um, and that started with a fascination on the, the Mexico US border, um, particularly Tijuana, San Diego, um, cause that's where I am and where I'm from um, and where I am now. Uh, but then it grew um, larger in a fine, fun, funny and timely way um, to where I started contemplating digital borders and uh, the way that we can use digital technology to um, kind of connect beyond uh, physical limitations and material limitations, which is um, funny and, and the opposite to you, Colin, a little bit. <laughs> Uh, but the same. Uh, and so now um, I'm in a really cool project um, that's kind of a call and response, a continual communication project um, with international collaborators um, and the physical movement and the physical projects and the, the location specific, like installations are all on hold. Um, and I'm kind of okay with that. I feel really attuned to some of the denser feelings and emotions and, and thoughts happening um, in myself and around in the world. But also, I think, um, I'm so sorry, I'm, Lena, Lena, very aware and also at the extreme of trust and possibility and fluidity um, available to us now. So just happy to be here and yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, one of the things that came up for me in listening was this idea of borders and um, what's gained and what's lost. And as a quadriplegic, I have most of my friendships and relationships are actually through the medium of this Zoom platform before that Skype and FaceTime. And so in a sense, I feel really familiar to this context. I'm probably on less Zoom calls than some these days, but to me, it's just kind of a second nature room in my house. So I didn't see that in that way until I listened to you all share. It stood out for me. I guess where I thought this conversation might go today that would be generative is, you know, things have really disassembled. And the economic and social impacts of this Uh, Ray Dalio is a is a one of the world's most, if not the world's most, successful hedge fund investor for fifteen or twenty years running, and uh, he made a tweet yesterday talking about the debt that we're incurring right now mm -hmm. and the the way that we go about addressing that debt whether we do it kind of in suffering together or if we do it in fighting with one another, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say a lot about how the future unfolds from here. And um, I was looking at uh, the Fortune magazine CEO writes a daily blog, and, and uh, the other day some of the bullet points in there were from groups like IBM about where, where, where is technology um, investment and focus going from here and how is the world going to change in those ways. Um, another in that same newsletter was about Jeff Bezos' net worth has just ballooned expansively in the, the hundred whatever is billions of dollars. And, uh, and how with the stock market doing what it's doing, many of the ultra rich are picking up some bargains and are gonna get more ultra rich on the other side of this as a result of things. And then you've got the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, donating almost a third of his wealth to COVID research and then whatever's not used in that onto uh, supporting uh, girls and women developmental efforts. And then you've got this narrative of kind of the new age or the, the progressive view that says we're in a renaissance, kind of the, the, the king has no clothes anymore. And it's all going to be different now. And Somewhere in this intersection, those are all going to be contributing factors. And there's probably 10 more high level important ones I haven't mentioned, but what's got me asking you all here today is that you're all creative, thinking, passionate, suffering people. And, and I just wonder, like, how are you seeing yourself mirrored in the larger commons? And how are you learning from that for yourself? And kind of what, what might you dare to aspire? What, what 
might almost be unspeakable in your own hopes for what we as small individual people might contribute or do, or what we might see emerging from our kind of just evolutionary animal collective. So that, that's kind of where I'd like to start, and I love any feedback or pushback or encouragement on that. I don't know if this is an answer to your question or not, um, but when you, when you pose the question about how do we see ourselves reflected, There's no question that question that I personally am dissolving right now. Like that that's that's sort of the word that describes my life experience at this moment. And as such, I I am in essence isolating even more from the world than I'm being forced to. So I could be on Facebook writing or doing videos and sharing sort of what I'm going through. And I'm not doing any of that, which I think is a little bit weird um, given who, you know, who I've been and, and what I normally do. And, and, I do. and I have felt a lot of pressure like this is a moment when logically I would, I would step into leadership. You know, I would step further into leadership and I find myself actually stepping further out So the isolation that is going on in the world is amplified here in my own house, here inside me. And I have no idea what's coming, like really none. And I, I find myself wanting to say to the world, we don't know what's coming. And that's the best possible place to be right now. If we can stop trying to predict what's coming, if we can stop trying to control what's coming, that will serve us better. And my, my personal contribution to that seems to be to, to practice it myself, to allow myself this, this total dissolving and, and to, to um, you know, come, come up against this feeling of you should be helping, you should be leading, you should be giving, you should be, uh, it's not enough to hold this wisdom. You have to then bring it forward and to say, actually, in this moment, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be that. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question even remotely, but that's what your question activates in me. I want to tell everybody that the name of Leanna's one woman show was Caterpillar Soup. And that was my first introduction to the way that the caterpillar dissolves inside the chrysalis into goo before becoming I a I kill just hearing you talk about it. I was on, a, on a, an alumni call for the, for the Generating Transformative Change community the other day. And somebody used that kind of metaphor that I've heard around for some time now about the, the imaginal cells that I'll repeat just briefly in case anybody doesn't know this, that the caterpillar has in imaginal cells that are basically dormant and then as it starts to move towards the butterfly phase, these, sort, these cells start to kind of come to life and are at first attacked by the immune system of the caterpillar. 
but then as it dissolves into soup, it's those cells that light up and actually connect to one another and create the, the lattice work that becomes the butterfly. And somebody was offering this kind of metaphor as a, as a natural growth process that we can observe maybe reflected in ourselves in, in, as a species in nature. And the, the pushback that I have in me about that, because there's a great Rumi poem, I, I won't quote it exactly, but it has to do with, you know, do you think that that which lived you into existence has orphaned you now? You know, that, that which produces the lush abundance of life on earth, do you think it has like set you here and abandoned you? To, to make your way? Or is that kind of vital life force not requiring you to be a leader? It's not requiring you to see the future. It's not requiring you to behave in some way for that natural process to unfold. And the, the pushback that I have on that very beautiful, I think, idea is that in some way, the evolutionary process through us is now able to look back at itself in a way maybe that's anthropocentric but because I can look at the evolutionary process and say look at it unfolding see where it's been and what are its patterns and how does it near itself to itself like maybe that's the same cognizance and consciousness that that force has always had and it's just now expressing through me or maybe there's some new self-development accountability in the evolutionary force that is ourselves looking back at, at our situation and acting with some agency of some kind of matter. In essence, do we decide who we become? Mm -hmm. I imagine there's a co-emergence there of us deciding and the world deciding and there being that space in which those two coalesce or um, with whatever's going on around us, but like that, that whole like I and we being permeable um, and it communicative, communicating vessels. Do you say that in English? Yeah. Communicating vessels? Yeah, it, the physics. Like, doesn't matter. Like, if there's water in one place and then there's less water in the other place and you put a tube between it, it'll communicate until they're level with hmm. each other. Yeah. So, context matters. And right now the context is everything's up in the air. So it's waiting. It's a great time to be in the chrysalis because what else is there to do? And even there, there's agency. There's, what do people need now? What can I do now? But that includes, you know, that that's, there's no, I don't, I, I have this, this great sense of whatever your system feels like doing now is the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And if that's stepping forward and offering all this help and, and doing all these things, then wonderful, go do that. If it's trying to make sense of this and, and offering that to people, go and do that. If it's turning inward and being, okay, bye, <laughs> I'll be over here. <laughs> go do that by all means. So I feel a lot of, 
Um, you know, whenever somebody expresses feeling guilty about how this is working for them, <laughs> or, you know, I just feel a lot of um, compassion, but also I want to, I want to advocate for that and be like, no, do that. I trust that impulse. I say that to myself as much as to anybody else. Uh -oh. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I kind of have a question about um, about taking in and processing certain types of information or feedback. Um, I'm thinking of a specific example that that came up for me the other day where um, my presence on social media has just been a lot about a lot about embodiment, just like a lot of like dancing all kinds of stuff. And um, I had a friend who was basically saying like, uh, like whatever you do, whatever signal you put out, you're implicitly communicating what people should be paying attention to. Like, okay. And I think there was a, there was like a critique in there from him, which is like, which is to say that the content that I am exploring isn't explicitly political, isn't explicitly like, it doesn't like encompass a larger sort of social uh, commentary or agenda or whatever. And um, yes, fully. I was kind of yeah. triggered by it. I was kind of triggered by it. I was just like, I was like, cause, cause in, in his critique was also, I think he was, he was like telling me how I should be feeling too. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I've just been, I've been, I've been sitting with it this morning and, and wondering like, um, I don't know, just reflecting on the place that he was coming from reflecting on like what parts of his critique are valid, which ones, which parts I should sort of toss aside. And it's interesting. It's really interesting because there is this, like, there is a danger I think of, of like falling into solipsism and just saying like, whatever I'm doing is the, the way and not taking in feedback. So I don't know. I'm curious about your own systems and how you have been calibrating what feedback is useful and what isn't. <laughs> Yeah, I bit, I got in a Facebook fight today as well. Uh, I, I ambled into one uh, and then found out that I'd started it. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. And what I've and skillful, <laughs> you know, like good, well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there's this, there's two things that stand out from what you're saying. One is that recognition and then also going like of, of, Oh, what, what's, what's mine? What do I need to take from this? What's going on here? Also this realization that not just me, but the, all everybody's chrysalis seems pretty thin skinned. Mm. Um, and because everybody's being bombarded, like their shields are at full capacity and all the energy is going there. And then, you know, stuff comes through in clunky and spiky ways. Um, and so, you know, that, that it's somebody posted to Facebook uh, yesterday, something along the lines of assume you're triggered. <laughs> Assume everybody else is triggered. Carry on. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think there's a truth to that. And so hobby horses and everything is like, everybody's hobby horses bumping into each other. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, what, what feedback to take, how, how to not become 
this bubble. I think there's a fair question in there. And to me, my, my like self, com like my compassionate question to myself is, has it been going on for a long time? Is this like the third or fourth signal that you're getting about this? If it's the first, eh. You know, like I trust that I have, um, I don't know, what's the word? This internal radar and that I would be able to tell. For a long, for a very long time, I did not. And I was constantly questioning myself, questioning everything I was doing, questioning, you know, like taking on what everybody else was saying. Negatively, not positively. Um, obviously, thought. And, um, and at some point I just realized, also through some psychedelic experiences, what's there to trust if not my inner compass while I'm still permeable. So, um, but I'm choosing. Like after, at, at the end of this day, I'm like, okay, I'm done with this conversation. I think it's gone as far as it's gonna go. So I'm, I'm not, I don't wanna expend more energy on that already. And that, if you're talking, we're talking about boundaries as well. And um, like you decide what you let in. And what was it Trungpa Rinpoche who said, be yourself, the world will give you feedback. Yeah. Um, and then, but then also like, what if, and then Brene Brown, the, the very wise, equally wise Brene Brown, <laughs> said, you know, the people whose feedback I take, I can write on this post-it note and that's, and then if somebody gives me feedback, I check, are you on the post-it note? No. Okay. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> yeah. So that's another, you know, so many ways of looking at that, but what works for you? Yeah. Yeah. I think something too that came up for me, mm -hmm. Kind of, I, I'm, I've, I've had my own journey to get to where I feel right now about all of this, which is very much to answer, I think, the original question, do I feel closer or further from the uh, communal? I think I feel both at the same time. Um, and I'm like really okay with that. Um, but along my journey to feeling that and being okay with that more more importantly I think for my sanity is being okay with that um was this journey through navigating a lot of like yeah other people's fears criticisms but not just that like thinking about what other people need right it's like as an artist as a creator or what am I supposed to be putting out right now do I have a responsibility to a type of content right and I I I was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, maintain a certain level of positivity. And then I just kind of stopped and was like, kind of like Lee, and I was like, mm, I'm going in that cave underwater with that, you know, magical glowing lake and I'm just staying there. Um, and kind of in between that was a lot of anger for the injustices in the world. Um, in particular, the rise of alcohol sales and the kind of like other paralleling rise of domestic abuse and thoughts of a lot of women and some men um, in, in like Latin America and street economy. So I was super angry for a while. And then I was able to just go in that cave and understand that from that place, I was going through my own process and that everyone else has their own cave and or maybe it's not a cave um and i was able to reflect also on my own actions through all of this journey very quick very short very expansive um and kind of see myself acting in my own integrity and finding the place in that stillness in reflection 
to really feel okay with that. Um, and my guess is that most people on this call will feel that too. Mm. And whatever that looks like, whatever that needs and calls for. Um, yeah, so then, yeah, just feeling, I think I want to go back to touching upon now where I am is feeling both further and closer to that collective because I feel like the, in terms of human beings, we are all in a fairly similar I don't want to say state, but almost like a rhythm. Uh, like the speed of life seems almost more um, similar energetically across the board, even though everyone's experiencing their different things. Um, we're all experiencing something, most of us at least, that we can connect upon. Um, and yet, it is the connection is this thing that is almost keeping us further apart at the same time. So, I just found that interesting. Can you say just a little bit more right there about the connection that's keeping us apart? Yeah, I mean, what we have, all of us on this phone call have in common more than this, probably, but at least this thread of being in isolation to a degree of the current circumstances, right? We're being kept separate. And yet we're together, we're connected because of that. I think that is on a larger scale also. I'm thinking about what Kabir said a little while ago about that this question of or uh, about that we choose who we are or who we're going to be or how, and do we choose um, and is there value in that and I think that's exactly what we're doing. I think we are choosing. And that choice is always, it's fluid. It's always evolving. It's always shifting. And feedback from the outside sometimes shifts it. And feedback from inside shifts it. And um, this conversation is going to shift it probably in ways that we can't, you know, for each of us that we couldn't anticipate right in this moment. But um, Everything is always impacting there. You, you can't, there is no way actually to step out of that dance because even when you step into isolation, so now the isolation is impacting that, that there is, there is no separateness. You know, we are not in my consciousness, we are not abandoned ever by that source because it isn't possible. It, there, there is nowhere I can go where I am separate from that. There is no, the only thing I can do is pretend to be separate from that. Um, and so I, I really appreciate, Colin, what you, you know, your, your sort of internal question about, okay, so there is solipsism, that does exist, and that has, there are issues around that, and is that what's functioning here? And what connection was I going to make to that? So I can't, I can't separate from source. The only thing I can do is to be in that dance. And the, the more consciousness I can bring to that dance and the more consciousness I can bring to, uh, or awareness as a little bit different from consciousness to what's impacting that dance and choices that I make about the relationship that I'm going to have to each of those things that's impacting in any given moment, the relationship I'm having with that dance. And I think ultimately, for me, it comes down to 
you know, during this time, during this incredible potency on a, on a species level, who, like, what do I want to see in the world? And am I being that person? <laughs> am I being that, that? And what I, I, I don't have, I, you know, I don't have a laundry list of, of my utopia, but um, I do know that among the things I want to see are humans in a deep state of trust of themselves and each other. And I want to see them, us, in a deep state of consciousness with that dance. And knowing that that's my prescription right there for myself. That's my job right now. How, however that looks, and it's going to look different from day to day, moment to moment. When you feed back those words um, to me that I said earlier, the, um, the word that comes forward for me is not so much that we decide, right? because as you said, Miriam, there's, there's more than just the solipsistic eye in the middle deciding and declaring what the world will be. There's that feedback that you're talking about, Colin, as well, that plays with that central identity. And the word that came up was intention. And then I heard a quote from Bob Dylan, those who aren't busy being born are busy dying. And so what came up for me with your question, Colin, about how do we meter the depth to which feedback gets in? You may have heard Daniel Schmachtenberger give this. He does it, I've heard it a couple of times in like two simple sentences. He basically just makes any posture that believes in the idea of a separate self look childish and absurd. And it's really eloquent and beautiful. And, you know, I still go back to believing that I'm me, but um, there's that trust and that there's that, that, that there's that we cannot ever get away from. I can't escape myself. Like, I'm going to spend the rest of the week trying to be inauthentic. <laughs> So when feedback arises, it feels to me like the process is one of breaking my heart open enough, breaking my identity open enough, breaking that solid sense of self open enough to see the perfect diamond truth of what's being expressed. It might not be what I think I'm hearing. It might not be what I, what I projected was that force or that person or that idea. But it, it couldn't exist if it didn't have its own total integrity. And it's a part of me. And so how do I listen for that thing in a way that allows me to metabolize that vision of myself. I just recently started apologizing again. For about five years, it was not, not acceptable to me to apologize. Because I had to, I had to see in myself that perfect inviolate truth in order to, 
to practice seeing it in others. At the same time where I wouldn't apologize, I also strove to claim every dysfunction, as you said, Miriam, as, as my own. If something's gone wrong here, and then I do this today at any scale, if the world is wrong today, if the world is hurtling towards a cliff, if there are hundreds and millions of people who are in existential crisis right now, even worse than three months ago, that's mine. And so that's where the idea of responsibility but, but, it, but intention seems to come around for me. Like, how am I going to, in this place of stillness, in my cave inside the sacred ocean or on the grand stage, how am I going to set my intention for this world that is mine to care for? So Colin, back to you, does that resonate with your question in any way for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, everything, everything that everyone has been sharing feels so high, like the ratio of signal to noise it's just like the signal feels so high, <laughs> which I really, uh, I really appreciate. Um, Kabir, I had to leave at the at the hour mark, but I wanted to stick around until this last thread was um, was wrapped up a bit. But I think I do need to sign off at this point. Um, yeah, I appreciate the time. It was really lovely to to meet everyone, and we have each other's emails. Yeah, because. We're in this email thread that could be started. Okay. Excellent. All right. Much love to everybody. Thanks for coming, Paul. Thank you. I'm always impressed, Kabir, with the amount of perspectives and the and the different levels that you can speak from. Um, and how complementary rather than oppositional they seem. Um, and I'm I'm left feeling curious I know you share a lot about what's going on for you and when you say you know that res response basically the weight of the world right <laughs> um, I, I resonate with that and then there's also this and it's just a little of me as well I'm you know so how do you, how do you transverse all those levels where are you at most of the time? I just, I just heard a, a teaching on a Tibetan, uh, I think it's a Tonglen meditation where you breathe in the suffering of the world and you exhale the, you know, grace and well-being for all beings. And uh, the thing that the teacher was saying to frame the teaching was that There's no way at all that any self can even begin to contain the suffering of that self, let alone the world. And I've been most of this call on the verge of tears. And so the word faith has been up a lot for me. And I have to have faith right now, I guess, that this 
idea of Kabir, this idea of me. It's really a useful construct, but not for everything. And so in that sense, I have, I have faith as though it seems generally very real to me every day and most of the minutes of every day. That I still have to seek to behave as though there is a self beyond what I wrap up kosha or a wrapper around that actually can address and hold all of the suffering and all of the possibility and can see all of the beauty. And so I think it's by orienting an intention towards love and compassion and at the same time surrendering that I'm by no means enough to make any of it work. And so I have to just keep showing up, you know, with this faith that that self that I occlude from my own eyes is there all the time doing the work. The, that word enough. Yeah. And Kabir, so what you just said, does that mean that you too are in a state of sort of questioning and listening right now? Or do you have a sense already of what to do with this moment in time or what to do with this, this, this potential that we're sitting in? Well, I, 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 I was so grateful the way that I spoke earlier and then Miriam, you just said, well, it's both. You just, you just, you, you just said the integral thing, you know, you said like, you know, I push back on you, Liana, for the idea of the surrender, which I obviously embrace. And, and I just realized that, like, and this, I think, goes back to what I said at, at the beginning of the call, was I have ideas, but I know they're not enough. I know they take more than me. When I look at my ideas, like I have this idea that like, like right now the world is up on a toe. And where it falls, and it will fall, is a matter of balance and direction. And right now, the right nudge from the right perspective with the right skill and the right wisdom might topple this world someplace far away from the impending tragedy that we were living six months ago or three months ago that's still present as a, as a possibility today. And so I have to believe that me and somebody or somebody without me can find that leverage point and just tap at the right moment. There's all this yet and the whole thing goes far, far away from a ruinous dichotomy of political adversity and economic disparity and climate ignorance and ecosphere carelessness. So I just know that like, whatever I is coming out of my mouth, like I'm so not 
going to defend it in the next minute because it's going to be so old and so antiquated as it leaves my lips. And at the same yeah. time, in simple terms, and I had this conversation once before this week, what's the design criteria for an injunction that meets the world today? It needs to meet most of everybody, which means it can't be grounded in the ideology, at least not one that's not fairly universal. It can't force anybody into a certain behavior because we've all got our own way. It can't require adoption of a unified thing. So the best idea I've got so far is a global marketing campaign. I forget what the Dalai Lama says, but he's got like, three or four things that he just says, these are universal to all human beings. We all want to be free from sickness. We all want to love, to be loved. We all want to be happy. Something like that. So like, you know, and then there's the re work on, on character strengths. You know, what are the different character strengths? It doesn't matter your religion or your race or your economic situation, but you know, if you can, be more generous or be more loving or whatever that means to you. So there's this idea that I have that we could tell a story globally, but not a very structured story. Just the imaginal cells of a story. And that we could just invite people with a positive message that they, that they have that story in them, that they are that cell, that they that whatever they see as good and true in the world, they can act on that. They can, they can progress that story and they can be seen as beautiful by those around them for doing so and that they can see others around them as beautiful for their stories. And not, not asking them to look across the aisle, not asking Democrats to see Republicans as beautiful, but just asking them all to see in themselves the creative potential. Something, I don't know, that's, it feels wrong even as I just say it out loud, but, but I really, like, I know there must be something that, that can be done right now. Well, it's easier to mold once it's said, isn't it? So the expression matters even if it's not turn, doesn't turn out to be the thing, start of a thing. Yeah, I, I'd like to turn that question to you, Lola. Sitting in front of, you know, your work every day is molding expression. What would you say about that process? Yeah, um, well, when you, when you just spoke, I remembered myself feeling at a certain point. I think it was the political thing that triggered me that like the far left and the far right actually have more in common, I think, to each other than, than a lot of people think in some ways. Um, and that doesn't really interest me that much beyond after that, what I saw was like an arm, like you have a body and you have two arms and say you were about to embrace someone by creating or something or air and you were creating a circle right by reaching and expanding so by point of expanding in opposite directions you find some kind of convergence point to create some kind of full circle i'm not exactly sure why that was the train of thought or the vision that i saw or i don't think it actually exactly answers your question but um what happened next is that I thought of what you said in the original statement of how does the circle make decisions as the circle for the circle. I'm not getting it right. You phrased it much more eloquently, but for me, there was something that was firing there that was like, that's it. But I couldn't connect it, which is funny. 
it doesn't really matter either, except for the fact that what it left me with was that expansion is what we can do right now. And maybe the question of creating, I, I think the question of the fluidity of the world right now is very conducive for expansion. I think each soul's expansion is, is of their own, right? And what that might, I don't know what that looks like. Maybe for me it is making, or maybe for me it's not making at all. Um, I'm not sure. I, I know those are fragments. I'm sorry. I wish it was more. I wish I could give offer more than that, but I don't know if I'm supposed to. <laughs> soup. Soup. Let me apologize. <laughs> because, Leanna, you asked me the question, do I have an idea? I do have an idea. I've got an idea about a marketing campaign. I, I've got the idea about what goes in it. I've got an idea about how you execute it. You know, it's full page ads, it's billboards, it's, new, it's, it's TV spots, it's internet. And I was afraid to say it that clearly because having an idea that formed feels like an agenda. And I don't want this conversation to be a place of agenda for me. And, 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 and I feel like, Lola, like, as you were speaking, I was sitting in the fractured integrity of having stumbled around Leanna's question. And I feel like your expression of fragments mirrored that, that I brought. That, that unwillingness to speak, like, quote, my truth, which I don't believe in, except I don't have anything else, so that's what I'm going with. you know, created that reflection of like, you speaking as though you couldn't cohere in the next moment. That's the first time in the call that I did anything of the sort, censored myself in any way. And then to hear you say, what well, if I'm supposed to say, that's such a mirror. Oh, are you on mute on purpose? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm, I'd have, I don't know if I, yeah, I think you said it. I was enjoying your laughter and then just. <laughs> the, this, this thought that at probably not random, but more serendipitous moments flies through my head sometimes is there's a perspective from, from which it makes sense. And the fact that I don't, don't seem able to take that perspective right now doesn't mean it's not there. And doesn't probably, you know, and it's, and it's okay that I don't know. There's a perspective from which what doesn't make Whichever, sense? From which whatever is going on ah. makes sense. And there's a time, the point in the future at which we'll look back and go, of course. <laughs> of course that's what happened. Of course everybody was doing this and that. Duh. Yeah. And this is very, there's a potency to it, right? Like that thing with what you said with the toppling. This is a, this is a potent time. And another thing that I get, that I want to, that somehow want to pull into this again is that, what did you say those cells were again? Imagine. Imagine, imaginative cells. That you said they get pushback at first. because the system doesn't like change. That means the death of their, their life means the death of the caterpillar. Yeah. I think that's what strikes me the most of, of, about that in, in terms of this time and how, how it's reflected in this time is that like things are, things are dying. 
you know, a way of being, a way of thinking, a, a way of relating is dying. And we have to let that die. You, nothing grows without allowing for that. So, you know, Lola talks about expansion and I, I totally resonate with that and this sort of sense of evolution. And it's simultaneous. It's not like, well, no, 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 you know, there will be no growing right now. We all need to sit tight and wait and wait for things to die. You know, it's just, just wait it out. Like it's, this is, it's all kind of happening at, yeah, I can't, it can't be, I would love to contain it into little pieces, you know, that, that would be super satisfying, but that's not how it works. Step one. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be messy and it's gonna happen simultaneously and, and things that, feel like they should come later or going to come first. And, um, you know, I'm sort of prepared for that, like, whoa, in a way that dissonance, but that, that is the, the natural way of it. But there is no question that the death has to be allowed and has to take place. Um, in order for there to be the space and the, the, the material, the resources, the, the cells, if you will, for something new to be born. That energy has to be released out of its current form to be made available. So what then are, for instance, skills that we can cultivate? Like one one thing that I'm kind of grokking as well as this this leaning into or accepting or being okay with uncertainty not knowing death um, I don't know like what like reaching reaching out receiving there's a back to my earlier thought about um Mirroring the uh, mirroring the collective. Um, and I know we're kind of just about to the time. I'm happy to stay on a little longer if anybody wants to carry on. But um, Liana, you you went explicitly through the metaphor that we're living through at a global level. And you, you came out the end, the other side of the butterfly. And so what would you say in answer to Miriam's question about what, what, what are the, the, the points that you could maybe tell us from that heroine's journey that, that you live, that, that got you through that dissolution and into the butterfly? I think the first piece of that is what I was just talking about. It's the allowing of the dying, which is contrary to every instinct that we have. Every inst yes, that's right. Every instinct that we have is to hold it together, is to try to somehow maintain what we know, what we've had, what we're comfortable with, even what we're uncomfortable with, but it's what we know. And so I think the, the first piece of that is definitely about recognizing that, yes, things are dying and letting um, I think allowing and letting are some of the primary skills of this experience right now. We are um, certainly American culture, and I, but I think this is true in many, many cultures in the world. There is this incredible uh, imbalance of, in value where we value the doing and the creating and the making and the organizing and the, the sort of um, this generative sense, which is glorious and lovely, but we don't have a lot of practice at valuing the, the dissolving, the decay, the destruction, the losing. Um, and there's huge, 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 huge value in that. So that would be, that's, you know, one of the first things that comes to mind. Um, and then it's, it's the sitting with this uncertainty and not sort of rushing ourselves to define and create what's coming next, which is also 
counter to instinct. The instinct says, oh my God, there's a vacuum here. We have to fill it with something. We have to make something out of this. We have to put something new in this space that we have. It's super uncomfortable. Just have all this space, have all these things that are undefined to not know anymore. Like, where is my edge? Where is, where is the, the limit of this skin? Oh, that's even as I just talk about that and feel that in my body, like it's terrifying. It's terrifying to not know where I end and other begins and to be with that boundarylessness and allow that space. What begins to happen in that, oh, in that space is without my effort and without my, um, what's the word? It's an M word. What am I looking for? Without my sort of managing it or guiding it, what begins to happen even without that and even better without that is that that energy begins to organize. And it has a, an intelligence of its own that begins to organize. And I can observe that organization. And again, the instinct is going to be, ah, I see what's happening here. Okay, I understand what we're doing. I'm going to jump in there and I'm going to start to create shape and form and I'm going to, I'm going to fit and press. And nope, <laughs> it needs its space to organize. And then at some point, my activity becomes part of that organization in a very organic way and that becomes expressed and typically i can't see that expression until it's arrived i can't i don't know what it's going to be i don't know what form it's going to take i don't know any of those things and there is expression along the way that's another key skill, which is to, um, so there's this, this death, this dissolving, and then there's this, this shapeless, formless, boundaryless being, and then there's the organization, that, this organic organization, and all of those things can be expressed along the way, and in a sense have to be, because even, even if it's not shared, publicly so to speak but that expression is medicine um, it helps us through the difficulty the the discomfort of those various stages so it's medicine for the process it's, it's like you know drinking the the tea that sustains, it's the tea that sustains us, you know, it's the nourishment that sustains us. And it's a little bit tricky because when we express, we want to, that agenda, you know, we, we want to use that expression to somehow move things or to change people's minds or to, mm, and that's, that's not the purpose of that expression. The purpose of that expression it's just medicine it's just medicine it's just an offering it's so sacred to me this process it's so so deeply sacred to me thank you for asking Thank you for revealing. Well, I really feel like a little bit overwhelmed with 
Marianne, you said at the beginning of the call that you knew this would be good. I didn't dare hope. I felt like I was just like stumbling drunk out of bed and it was hurt feels really on the other end like we've had a really profound and beautiful call. And I really feel like yeah. We had only cooked something so that you could share that sacred journey with us. It describes, I think, really well what we're all going through right now. I so say thank you all for being your beautiful selves, and being in my life, and being willing to come and play here. You know, Maybe I can play a role in your grand ideas of world domination. <laughs> or maybe we can come back here and just be in this space again as the evolution progresses. Yeah, it's a good touch point, touchstone. <laughs> Thank you. Sweet dreams to you, Nuria. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wonderful days to you, too. Thank you. Thank you. You're on the West Coast with me. Mm -hmm.